Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and it is February 25th. We are back. Today is Thursday. We have an absolute ton of stuff, a plethora, an avalanche of things to share with all of you. But uh, before I hit the record button, Julie and I were just talking. Um, you know what? I'm not being political here at all, but I completely and totally understand why in some um, states the teachers don't want to go back uh, mm-hmm. to uh, <laughs> don't want to go back to work. <laughs> I completely and totally sympathize with them. And again, I'm not trying to be political and, you know, and all that. Because, listen, a lot of the kids, ours included, they've gone partially feral. Yes, the little savages. Yeah. Those poor teachers, man. Or maybe the poor kids. I don't know. I suppose it depends on your school. I know. The teachers, but, uh, can, ha- can you they're imagine? They're for it, man. They're going to have to pay for essentially a year's worth of children losing uh, uh, all grips of reality and how they're supposed Running to behave. Running wild. Yeah, I know. So anyway, so if you're a teacher or know a teacher out there, as kids start to go back to school, you know, we all have to basically uh, support our, our teacher community. Julie's parents uh, were are retired teachers. Uh, I guess in a strange way, Julie and I are teachers as well. But our uh, our people aren't um, completely feral. They're just partially feral, a.k.a. real estate agents. Well, that's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> should be able but, to not, but not like a bunch of seven-year-olds. Can you imagine? Oh, oh my goodness. I know. I know. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be scary. So today we're going to finish up the points we started the other day, or yesterday rather, and we were talking about why it's absolutely critical you become a listing agent. But before we do, we have a special – actually, Julie wanted to share with uh, this with all of you guys. Michelle McClinton talk who is a coach for us she was and i think still is probably regarded in the nation as the number one um i would say primarily short sale specialist expert she's helped set up uh, short sale programs for banks she's worked directly uh, with the major servicers and lenders she was an integral part of our um, team back in uh, the real estate crisis and she's still a great friend of ours also a past coaching client too. And uh, she sent Julia a message that all of you guys need to know about and uh, just be aware of. Yes. And so you guys should know by now that we're very committed to letting you know from the front lines exactly what's happening, when it's happening, so that you can be prepared and not be surprised by anything. So let's get into Michelle's email. So again, you set Michelle up as absolutely somebody that we can trust on this stuff because yep. she's in the front lines. Okay, so hi, Julie. Hope you guys are doing well. We are starting to see more and more short sales creeping into the marketplace. I have 14 new short sales just last week. The market in South Florida is strong and fast. Though I don't believe we'll see a crash like we did last time, I do believe we'll see a sharp increase in short sales to come. In today's environment and what we saw as a result of 2020, meaning COVID, every agent needs to add the to the interview process when listing. Okay, so she's talking about... We refer to that as our listing toolbox. The seller pre-qualification is part of that toolbox. And our grizzled veterans will know, I'm going to do quickly, I'm going to go through eight very specific questions when you are talking with your sellers. Now, before I do that, Tim, on our Premier Coaching, we've been talking a lot about the necessity of presenting net sheets to sellers, right? They can't make a, a decision about pricing or moving or anything else if they don't know about what they're going to net. Agents get afraid of that. I talked to that. Actually, there was a clubhouse that um, you and I were presenting on yesterday, this morning. I don't remember all of our, <laughs> you know, all of our public, uh, all of our media syndications sort of blends in my brain. Uh, and someone was essentially asking how to protect their commission. And in our coaching program, one of the things we prescribe to all of you to do is exactly what Julie just said, is present a net sheet. But on the net sheet itself, don't put your commission down as just the obvious you know, target that they should be, sellers should be focused on. You want to basically break the commission down into thirds where you're showing in essence what, you know, there's the marketing fee, there's a negotiation fee. You guys get the gist of it. It's all part of our coaching program. And we teach you how to do all this. And that way it does not keep your commissions in the crosshairs of the seller's eyes of things to maybe go after. And then you always want to focus the seller on what their net is. And so the question then becomes, Mr. Seller, what's more important to you? How much you net from the sale of this property? And this is what you'll net and just circle it on the net sheet or what I make. I mean, Mr. Seller, at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, 
what difference does it make what the commission is as long as the check you're walking away from closing meets or exceeds your expectations? But Julie is talking about expanding the importance of the net sheet for the sake of actually preparing yourself for any of uh, surprise issues that come up as a result of this crazy, you know, basically going on two years we've all been living through. Yes. So I'm going to actually skip ahead a little bit to make this point. What we're talking about is the net sheet. And Michelle's specific point here is that agents are, she she does short sales for agents, right? So she has a lot of agent communication. She's been seeing them screw up the net sheets. That's the bottom line here. Okay. So she said, recently, I've had about 10, 10 homeowners list their properties with agents. These are agents she works with. Go into contract, go through inspections, appraisals, et cetera, only to get news from the title company that they had to bring thousands of dollars that they didn't have or anticipate to take to the closing table. In my experience, when this happens, it creates a domino effect with the transaction. The homeowner blames their agent for not knowing this. The buyer's agent blames the listing agent and the homeowner for not knowing this and in turn questions the agent's credibility. Hence, buyers want to sue because they cannot close and have incurred costs associated with the situation. Okay, so... What most people don't realize is if the homeowner did a loan mod, a forbearance, or a deferment, their uh, payoff is not reflective in those situations until we get to the title agent. Okay, so let's level off there. If you did a mortgage forbearance, the mortgage parent payments you did not make are tacked to the end of the loan or the loan payoff. So I want you to be very clear about that. If you were one of the, you know, we frankly suggested that many of you seriously consider forbearances back when COVID hit because nobody knew what was going to happen mm-hmm. with housing. So Julie and I told you guys to seriously consider the SBA PPP loans and the uh, all the other things we told you to do, including mortgage forbearance, not just on your principal resident, but also on your rental properties. Many of you did that. Many of you did that in anticipation. Well, frankly, um, you know, in case the markets had gotten worse and the exact opposite happened, which was fantastic. But the reality of it is, is those unpaid payments go on to the unpaid mortgage balance. And so those payments do have to be paid. Do not confuse this with you somehow make having to make when your forbearance is up, having to make the payments up at the end of your forbearance. That is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the mortgage payments that say you were on forbearance for 12 months and your payment was $1,000 a month and you owed $100,000 on your house. Now you owe $112,000 on your house. Yes. We are not saying that that at the end of your forbearance at the 12 months, you have to come up with a $12,000 check. Do not be confused. Unless you're selling the house. And Unless it, you're selling the okay? house. So that's the Or thing. refinancing, really. Or refi. And, yep. and the, it, I mean, here's the rub is most people don't read all of that stuff. The forbearances actually say that should you refi or pay the house off, that is one way to pay us back. Okay. So here's to your point. Let's say that you owed that 100000 You skipped 12 months in forbearance. So now you owe one hundred and twelve. When they went into forbearance, the homeowner was thinking, I owe a hundred grand on this house. Right. Okay. And then they go and sell it and they're all geeked up. They're going to buy something after, you know, even, even after they've resumed the payments and then they get to closing and the title company's like, no, it's actually 112,000. That's when the heart attack happens. And not to mention the 112,000 plus the actual selling fees of the commissions and whatnot. So you can see how, and honestly, to Michelle's point, it is truthfully the, the listing, listing agent's, agent's responsibility. It is yes. the listing agent's fault. Okay, so they how do we have, cure that? They should have been asking the tough questions. Yes, yes. So you cannot continue to be listing agents and be fearful of asking these questions. Some of these, especially our more veteran agents, they're going to be like, well, yeah, I do that all the time, but we're going to add a couple of questions just to be careful here. Number one, how much do you owe on your property? Again, this is anticipation of doing the... Um, you know, the seller's net sheet. Number two, are you current on your mortgage? Number three, have you missed any payments? Number four, during 2020, did you do a forbearance? Number five, have you ever done a loan mod? Number six, any second mortgages, including lines of credit or HELOCs, home equity line of credit. Uh, and, you know, we used to have sellers all the time that thought that their HELOCs were not attached to the house. I know. It's home equity line of credit. Okay, number what seven. What do you mean I have to pay that back? I, I know. I know. That would, I mean, even in normal situations, that comes up. Do you remember pulling into yeah. sellers' houses, like when we were selling real estate? And if you, like, saw a boat in the, you know, somewhere on the property. Oh, yeah. So we, you know, it's a, <laughs> it was a joke that Jilly and I would look to see if there was a boat in front of the property and a hot tub in back. And if you walked in and saw a pool table, well, you know damn well that they took out a That's HELOC, HELOC money. <laughs> and they bought all that stuff and they have yeah. a lot less equity than they think. But anyway, yes, I you got to ask these questions. Okay. Number seven, any judgments, including credit cards, liens like state or federal? So yes, your state taxes, you know, your state and the Fed can, can lien your house for unpaid taxes. 
again, things that make agents uncomfortable Actually, to ask. Jules, that brings up an interesting question I have mm. for you, and you might know the answer to this. I bet you do. Yeah. Um, Consider you're the nation's number one uh, real estate coach, well, according well, to many. The pressure's on now. Yes, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so if you have, we're in forbearance, and the property tax, who, how is the property tax being paid? Was the property tax also in forbearance? Um, the lender continued to pay it, I believe, was the case. So the lender continued to pay it with your the amount of money that you'd that prepaid? That they had escrow or that, that ends up being in your bill and what you owe at the back end as well, I uh, think. Uh, you think. So we don't yeah. know. So it's very likely in some cases. It could be worse than just what you owe. Right, because it could have very well been you still owe property taxes if your house was in forbearance mm -hmm. and or your sellers in this yeah, case. Yeah, now some states were allowing people to um, defer their property taxes so that you could have a separate agreement possibly. Yeah. So... Who knows? Something to check on, certainly. Okay, number eight suggests, she suggests ordering a payoff from the lenders early. Okay, so coaching moment on this. In every situation, even if you have a seller that everything looks spick and span, no, none of these issues, whatever, I still, we still highly recommend that you get the payoff early and you do lien searches early and uh, survey early because nobody wants to deal with this stuff at the 11th hour, right? If you find out, oh yeah, now I remember that credit card thing I didn't pay and that was a judgment and I thought that was off my credit. You don't want to find out about that the day before closing or the day of closing. You want to be able to take care of that so that I, it either doesn't wreck the closing or doesn't severely piss your seller off at you. So I'm going to give you, head of coaching, yeah. um, a, a challenge. I sure. don't think that any agent, even experienced agents, are going to go through all these questions and feel comfortable asking I them. I think you're right. I think we should make this into a form. And I think we should include it in our ultimate home selling system, which is part of Premier Coaching. Mm -hmm. And I think we should start institutionalizing this per Michelle McClintock's suggestion yep. into all of our coaching clients' uh, normal processes when they're taking a listing. I, I'm ahead of you on that. We're embedding it. Me. We are basically, I, I'm, I'm making it a little bit less like, here's eight questions you have to answer. It's going to be more conversational. Right. Um, it's going to be embedded in the seller's pre-qualification. But I'll tell you, so if I'm just thinking And again, or seller's net sheet. It, well, exactly. It, well, yeah. but specifically, this is something that the sellers should fill out right in their own handwriting yeah. and then sign. Okay. That way the listing agent has it in their uh, yeah. folder to CYA, if nothing it's else. It's almost honestly. like a seller financial disclosure, essentially. Yeah. And you could even do this. You could use like a Google Forms or something like that. Yeah, to that's actually, a good idea. You know, that, that's the move Spin here. Spin it off on its own thing. Mm, well, for yeah, our- Kind of a net sheet for them. For our case, though, yeah. let's just do it in paper form and so that we can then, um, they can then make it digital if they want to. But the point yeah. being, just give these questions to the seller and let the sellers answer these questions. That way, some of you won't have to have these. I mean, I don't think I'm going to feel very- very comfortable after I've uh, wooed a seller into listing a house with me to ask if they have any judgments, including credit cards, liens, state or federal, um, yeah. or whether they, you know, all these other questions. It should be more like a worksheet for them. It like should just be. part of the process. It's, it goes along with, say, your property disclosure, you know, right. kind of normalizing this. Um, but and I we, think Michelle makes a good point. You can't well, skip it. Let's continue to talk about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Just so sure, the, sure. I hopefully sparking some thoughts for some of our great uh, podcast listeners, of which we have tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll tell you exactly where I would suggest this be included. So when we, when you are about to take a listing, part of our process is you send over a pre-listing pack. We have as part of our coaching program, a completed pre-listing pack. In other words, we have it done for you. And the pre-listing pack in essence is pre-sells the seller into listing with you. The whole point of the pre-listing pack, and I'm saying this in a different way, just to emphasize this, is to remove all of the stress from the room prior to you getting to the seller's house. In other words, all the toughest questions that a seller might ask you have already been pre-answered in the pre-listing pack. Julie and I have given the sellers the question and we have given them your answer. And we've already done all this for you. It's part of the pre-listing pack, which is part of our uh, premier coaching program. And no, we will not sell the pre-listing pack individually because it's out of context and you won't learn how to properly use it. So inside the pre-listing pack, we also suggest you give the seller a net sheet. And now, Julie, to mm -hmm. my point, I think you should also include this as part of the pre-listing pack. Yes. At least probably for the next few years as we see I the that's ramifications, right. all these forbearances. Yeah. And, and I mean, even even in normal situations, you know, people misstate or, or don't have an accurate payoff or, you know, random le uh, liens can be on the property and different things. But I'll, I will make this so that it's more easily digestible. Okay, thank you. Because it does come off of, I mean, this came from Michelle, so this this is not the polished version. Yeah. She's just making the point. Ask those questions. So isn't it interesting, though, 
that we can have a hot seller's market and all of this equity out there and not be in a distressed market and still have to have some of these conversations. Well, let's let's take this to another level, mm-hmm. which means we're not going to get to the seller points. We'll do those tomorrow. Okay. But I'll tell you, this takes me back to the conversation we had with our friend Rick Sharga mm-hmm. at Realty Track, yeah. And we were talking about the fact, in essence, that it's projected to be 600,000 homes in default. Mm-hmm. And um, which, I mean, frankly, that's a very small number compared to the what number the that were in yeah. default back in the uh, crash. But here's the moral of the story. A lot of the people that are going to be in default are the people that are presently in forbearance. And so what's going to happen is they're going to come off forbearance. Oh, we should share with them that uh, the article I sent to you. But they're going to come off forbearance, and then they're not going to be gainfully employed in such a way that they can afford the house payment. Now, listen to what your coach is telling you right now, because it's critically important that you remember this. A lot of these sellers who are coming off forbearance, even with the missed payments tacked on the unpaid mortgage balance, they're still going to have equity in their properties. Now, what happens is, and there's different statistics on this, but the one that we use is that once someone misses a house payment, once someone misses one single house payment, there's a 95% chance that they're going to go into default. I've heard 93%, but you guys get the gist of it. In other words, people don't bring- It's highly likely. Right. It's highly likely. People don't bring their mortgages current, which by the way, that's the reason notice defaults are a great source of listing leads. But in this weird, strange, you know, mortgage forbearance, end of COVID era, you're going to see a lot of folks, they're going to come off their forbearances, aren't going to have jobs, aren't going to have jobs that pay the same amount, not be able to make their house payments, but be sitting on a lot of equity. If they miss one payment, that house is going to you know, most likely go into default. And then when it goes into default, they're going to trash their credit. So even with equity, they'll have almost an impossible time purchasing another house. Now, you can then um, save them from uh, missing a payment. You can save them from then having the house go into foreclosure and potentially losing all that equity by listing the property for them and having the, helping them to cash out. And then maybe they have to rent for a while while they you know regain uh, or find employment that's going to make them so they can qualify for another house. Or maybe they just take that equity and they move it towards a lesser expensive house that they can afford on their lesser uh, income. Point being, this is a huge opportunity, a historical opportunity to help you know roughly six hundred thousand people. So even so, there's a lot of people that are in forbearance that are you know your neighbors. Maybe you are, um, and all those folks are going to start thinking, okay, now that I can't uh, you know essentially not, I have to start making my payment again. I can't make my payment. I would start in your community being at least aware that there's going to be a lot of people in that situation, and start conditioning yourself to have the conversations where you can save them from having to frankly, lose all their equity and trash their credit and uh, default. Yes. And so remember, uh, inexperienced, distressed-ish property listeners, okay, just because somebody is behind, just because they owe that forbearance money does not necessarily mean they're going to be a short sale, which a whole bunch of agents live in fear of and have heard horrible stories. Okay. So most cases, Tim, to your point, are going to have equity still. Yep. So yes, they're in default, but they still have equity. So you've got to get in front of that. Now, uh, Fannie and Freddie just gave these guys a huge gift by extending, by allowing some forbearances. I don't know how they're going to qualify F-H-F-A, that. FHFA, right? And it, well, Fannie and, yes, FHFA yeah. um, has said that you may be able to extend your forbearance by 90 days. Now, the 12-month forbearances were starting to run out. It was uh, scheduled to be up on March 31st. So as of March 31st, you were going to have to either start making your payments uh, or not. Now it is June 31st. So that just bought all of you time. You now have roughly four months to get in front of this and talk to your friends, your neighbors, certainly people in your database. I mean, your past clients and your centers of influence. I guarantee you there are people in that list in your database right now that are freaking out trying to figure out What's going on with their mortgage? What are they going to do? It's your job to get the house sold and allow them to, to have some equity. Whether they're able to buy something you know, in the near future or not, that remains to be seen. But at least they'll have the money to rent with, to move with. This not, is, I mean, honestly, Tim, not doing that, not doing that kind of outreach, I, I think is kind of like malpractice. If you've got a real estate license and you know about this stuff and you know how to help people, but you don't do anything about it. I don't like that. Well, you guys are always looking for sources of listing leads and thinking you have to basically over invest and 
buying leads in whatever form the purchase leads are going to be, social networking and whatnot. But the reality of it is, is you're constantly surrounded with sellers that have to sell. You just aren't honestly doing, you're not looking in the right places. And Julie and I are hopefully sparking some creative energies within all of you to realize that there are going to be, in this case, hundreds of thousands of people. They're going to have to sell their houses most likely. And you might as well be the listing agent. I mean, how many of those do you actually have to list? And what some of you will absolutely be shocked and stunned by is the fact that many of these uh, houses that are projected to go into um, foreclosure, in essence, or at least be on the road to default, are not in the less expensive areas than the most expensive areas. And the areas, frankly, in California and places like that, where people haven't been able to work, where yeah, maybe Vegas people, will be full of this. For oh sure. yeah, where people have been maybe overextending themselves. And there's another uh, report that you and I were uh, given that showed that something like of uh, the see what well, basically the crappiest quality loans were issued in just like the last couple of years with the mm-hmm. least amount of money down. So those are the people that are going to be at most risk. at risk, right? Because they're not going to realize that those forbearances may have wiped yeah. out. Well, I would doubt that too many of them have no equity, but they're going to be surprised that their balances. And it's probably yeah. going to be a tighter call for those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But these are the types of things that give you an unfair advantage in the marketplace because you now will have access to information that other listing agents won't. Nine agents out of 10, when faced with a seller that has a, uh, you know, essentially a nothing, how would I say? I want to say complicated, but I'll say somebody that has an issue that's not just simply show up, put the sign in the yard and wait for it to sell type seller, that most agents are going to walk away because they're not going to know what to do. Most brokers and office managers are not going to know how to help their agents to help those sellers to solve the problem. So again, that creates more opportunity. This is another example, like for example, during, now again, we do not think there's going to be a big massive amount of depreciation in the marketplace. Matter of fact, the exact opposite is going to be true. Is going to be true. There's going to be a massive amount of inflation or what a lot of agents will call appreciation of homes. Um, and it's real estate is going to be probably one of the best residential real estate, not commercial, is going to be one of the best things that you could possibly own probably for the next forever, really. Really, honestly, Probably. and we're going to see such radical, uh, huge amounts of inflation in asset prices, but in real estate in particular, that owning a home is a home run. Um, so, you know, there's not going to be a big drop in prices. There's not going to be a big round of depreciation like there was last time. Um, so look, the bottom line is, is there's going to be more upward pressure on pricing, which makes it so that you can help a lot of these people out of their payment situation if they can't afford the house anymore. And most likely they're going to walk away with a check and you're going to walk away with a check too. And sellers like this are the best types of sellers because you really help them solve oh, a they're problem. They're so loyal. I mean, they'll refer so much business to you. I, I was always surprised that our most our most loyal clients from our real estate career were two categories. One is for sale by owners. Yep. And the other one is people that uh, we either got them out before the short sale or negotiated for them for a short sale. Because, I mean, that is the truest um, manifestation of helping people solve a problem. Let me scale that. And actually, you know? and I, this will ring a bell. Do you know how we originally met Michelle McClintock? It was related to short sales somehow. I we think. taught her how to do short sales. Yeah, that's she right. was she was one of our short sale coaching ago. clients ages ago, yeah. back in 07. That's she right. was, she was I think she came in um, in 07. Mm-hmm. And I remember when she, you know she was obviously a rock star. So she's just totally absorbing all the information. But she was a coaching client. Yeah. Now why back when we were teaching agents how to do short sales back really before the market truly crashed because mm-hmm. we saw it coming. What, what I mean, those agents that knew how to do short sales ahead of the rest of the market yeah. had a ridiculous advantage. Absolutely. Of the, yeah. And because they had huge advantage because the other agents would run into these sellers and the sellers would be uh, near upside down or upside down in their mortgages. That meaning simply that they owe more than the house is worth. And the sellers would have to then be, you know, the listing agents that didn't have the skill set or the you know agents who were trying to vie for the listing didn't have the skill set to solve the seller's problem. Mm-hmm. They just walked away. They didn't know how to solve the problem. Well, they had fear of the unknown. Right. And they didn't learn. And a lot of agents for a long time, when the market turned, they would make fun of short sales. Other, oh, a know. lot of our competitors were making fun of them. And the agents that were that knew how to do short sales realized it was an incredible opportunity for them to be of service to other people. Uh, they're the ones that made fortunes. Absolutely. I, they really Michelle did. being one of them, right? <laughs> Michelle being one of them. You Michelle know. and her whole family. Yeah. I mean, they were selling, I don't even know how many houses per year in That's Southern it. Florida because yeah. they were all short sales yeah. and because she built a reputation of being able to solve people's problems. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why we use her brain. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and But the point of it being 
is that ultimately these are skills that you look, we're in a ridiculously hot seller's market right now, but they're going to be pockets to Michelle's point of where there's going to be distressed sellers or near distressed sellers. You need to at least have the skill set or the knowledge base to have the conversation so you don't just walk away from that opportunity to be of service to that seller. That's right. So your answer is yes, it'll be my pleasure to help you with that. It's my pleasure to help you solve that problem. You know, and I think ultimately that really makes an agent more confident because it does put them in a position where they can be of service well, to other people. Knowledge equals confidence. Ignorance equals fear. Yeah. You have a choice to make. Is that the right? bottom line? It is the bottom line. And, and you know, I, I think the fact that in most cases there's going to be equity still is, is yep. such a blessing for these people because had the market not done what it did, they would all probably be short sales. I mean, so, we've seen that before. So the natural question would be, if I were listening to this, I would say, how do I identify uh, who are the people that are coming off for uh, forbearance? And here's the answer. There is no list. No. There's no way for you to determine it. But I'll tell you, the best way to go about doing it is starting with your centers of influence and past clients. Sure. If you don't have past clients, start with at least your centers of influence and uh, have uh, have the ability and the willingness to have this conversation with folks at least having the starts of the conversation with folks. And then you'll start uncovering all these people that are in this uh, situation. And uh, I'll also suggest that Mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of people that are like, where was there in your town or community where there was uh, essentially a drop in income from, uh, you know, people losing their jobs? Where things closed for good. I always lean on the restaurant. Well, Vegas, there you go. Vegas is a perfect example. Vegas is a perfect example. And Reno as well. Right. Where there were people that had their whole livelihoods dependent on tourism and there was no tourism anymore. In certain parts of California, where they have these, you know, where the states were the most restrictive as far as lockdowns, right? Where's that going to be? You know, I bet you in those markets, you're going to discover that a lot of the people that were uh, essentially on lockdown receiving no pay or partial pay for a long period of time, they're, and those jobs don't come back. In a lot of cases, the restaurants that close, they don't reopen. Most restaurants, most businesses, they don't only have they have no savings, or if they have savings at all, it only lasts them for sixty to ninety days. So a lot of the businesses that like people are anticipating there's going to be a huge rebound in the economy as soon as there's a uh, as soon as frankly the the vaccine becomes um, widespread and herd immunity kicks in the whole thing. And that's true. That absolutely is true, and it's going to create a lot of new opportunity. We have no doubt about that. But a lot of the businesses that were closed will not reopen because. Frankly, they just don't have. They didn't have the cash flow to yeah. make ends meet and make and pay their bills, and so they're just not going to come back. Um, and a lot of the loans that were issued through the PPP and the uh, EIDL through the uh, through the SBA, a lot of those loans are going to be defaulted on because the businesses just didn't have the yeah. ability. And even if they do open back up again, let's say you have a restaurant and you want to open back up, and you had these, you know, maybe your restaurant had this long term reputation because you have like a really great serving staff, and you know, and all these people, maybe they're not. Um, frankly, they took other jobs, or maybe they moved. And so the reason that your restaurant was successful is because your killer wait staff and they're not available anymore. Well, there goes your, you know, the reason that your restaurant was successful or one of them. You guys get the gist of it. But you really have to talk to your database and find out who needs your help. You know, there's so many reasons to be, it's so, uh, I don't know, it's it's such a duality that you can call, you should be calling, of course, your, your database and you have these dueling situations, right? So in some cases, you're going to say, you know, if I could get you 20% more than I could get you last year, last year for your house, because we have these this evidence that of pricing, you know, what would that do to your plans? And then on the other hand, you might be helping somebody with their forbearance situation. I just think it's interesting that we have these things going on at the same time. Well, combine all of that, right? And so one of the better ways to approach your centers of influence and past clients to broach this sort of maybe uh, prickly topic would be simply calling with your list of buyers who are looking to purchase in the area and using what you just said. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have agents in um, all of our biggest coaching markets who that's exactly what they're doing. We're telling them to start with their centers of influence and past clients and outside of that, start calling everybody and just simply say, because most of these sellers are not going to know their properties have doubled in some cases in value or some super hot markets have gone up by an extreme amount. Mm -hmm. Tell that seller, call those prospect prospective sellers and let them know, just be strictly, you know, directly to the point and say, if I were to pop by with a buyer that's willing to pay, you know, X for your property or in that range, would you consider selling the property? That type of question. Mm -hmm. And then maybe that's when you can start broaching the topic about whether whether or not they're uh, coming off forbearance. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing that I have seen with our coaching clients that are calling on expireds. A lot, of, I don't know what a lot would constitute, but I have several cases from just the past you know, two or three weeks 
Um, they're coming across expireds who were significantly overpriced because they were trying to pay off their forbearance money yep. or because they were, you know, COVID related reasons. And so uh, in some cases, depending on how old the expired was, you still might be able to get a good price. But we're seeing when they're when they're truly overpriced that it's that reason. And so that might be somebody that you could turn into a short sale. It's going to take asking the tough questions and working things out, but certainly saving them from ending up in foreclosure. So all of these things are happening at the same time. And your only job is to figure out what situation you're going to help the most with. You're not going to know who needs your help without talking to your, your people. So start with that. And then, you know, you can expand out to the NODs and see what's going on with the expireds. There's lots of opportunity here to be of service. Back to you. Not back to me. Sorry, I'm you're writing. <laughs> so we probably need to give them some homework. Yes. I think the homework is, you know, split out your, look at the total number of people in your database and, you know, divide that. I always say divide it by 20 days. There's 20 work days in every month. That'll tell you how many people you'd have to call every work day to actually speak with everybody every 30 days. If that number is too big, maybe you come up with, you know, 15 and you know you're not going to make that many per day. Then divide it by 40, divide it by 60. Even if you even if you have, you know, you talk to five people a day, it takes you 90 days to get through your whole list. What would your business look like if you talk to your entire database every 90 days? I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why people don't do it. So a quick reminder, Julie and I are doing, uh, well, frankly, Julie and I and a lot of our other uh, coaches and top coaching clients, we're doing a, a clubhouse event. It starts every morning at 8 a.m. East Coast time. Um, and we're going to expand that as we pick up more um, regular uh, attendees. And the Clubhouse event is called Masterclass Real Estate Mindset Motivation and Money. Masterclass Real Estate Mindset Motivation and Money. Or you can just uh, find search Julie and I on Clubhouse and uh, then you'll find the room that we're hosting every single day. If you're not on Clubhouse, um, be, and it's, essentially it's not public yet, you can still uh, – uh, by the way, did you send out your Clubhouse invites? I, I was about to do that. You reminded me. Okay, yes. good. So Julie has Clubhouse invites. If any of you guys want Clubhouse invites. I'm, I'm full, but that's you're, okay. You're okay. Well, so um, the Clubhouse is going to get out of beta, and which means it's going to go public. So here's the homework I'll have for all of you. Personally, I think Clubhouse or whatever uh, type of you know audio-only t- um you know, social networking is going to be the next big thing. There's no doubt about that in my mind. But as far as Clubhouse goes, it's definitely got an unfair advantage. You've been reading about it in the news. You've been hearing about all these, you know, big name people, business leaders and celebrity types that are starting to be on Clubhouse. I would strongly encourage those of you with iPhone, because it's not available on Android yet, to hop over to your app store and download the app, Clubhouse, and then reserve your name because there's going to be a mad rush to people for people who are going to be joining once it's out of beta. And all the, you know, your name is going to no longer be available. So definitely go and reserve your name. And then they put you on the list to get into Clubhouse. And from what I've heard, for most, for the most part, people get in within a week or two. Uh, but this Clubhouse uh, communications uh, thing is going to also be a killer way for you to start communicating with your real estate centers of influence and past clients. And we're going to be sharing with you some ideas on how you can go about doing that as well. But in the interim, make sure you do your homework. And what was the homework again, Julie? Start calling everybody in your database at least five people a day. That's real conversations. A contact is a conversation with a decision-making adult about real estate. Okay, so five a day, minimum standard. You will discover who needs what kind of help from you. And, you know, your business is absolutely going to increase as a result. Yeah, maybe you pick up some buyers. Maybe you pick up some referrals. Doesn't matter. You need more business. That's right. And um, if you guys want to join, any of you interested in joining eXp Realty, Julie and I are definitely affiliated with eXp. We would love uh, to be your personal sponsors at eXp Realty. If you're ready to join eXp, you're looking for the right sponsor. We would appreciate uh, the opportunity to interview for the job of being your sponsor. Mm -hmm. You can just, you can just text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Thanks for continuing to make this the number one listen to daily podcast for real estate agents in at least the United States. It's uh, continued to be successful because you guys continue to share it with other agents. And that is your secondary homework assignment. Please do consider giving us a five-star review over on iTunes. And also please do consider sharing this podcast with other agents. Help us live our mission, which is being of service to all of you. And, uh, and by being of service to all of you, we're giving you the useful information that will put you in a position to help other people. And I think this today's show was a great example of that. Um, in the meantime, we'll talk with you on the show tomorrow.
This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.